Welcome to Grace Minutes with Brother John. Today's question, how to be a Christian at work. Hey, you beautiful people out there. This is Brother John and welcome to Grace Minutes. I I had a question asked me about uh, being a Christian at work and, and how we handle that when there are Christians and non-Christians or people who don't act like Christian or non-believers in our workplace. And so we're going to address that that suggestion here in a second but what i would suggest to you is if you have any topics you want me to cover uh in the e- description box below is the email grace church at, of the center at gmail.com and per- just send send me a, a, a suggestion of something you want me to cover whether it's a scriptural passage or a topic go right ahead so let's let's get into to this and uh but first let's go to the lord in prayer Almighty and glorious God, we give you thanks this day, and we pray that as uh, we have health care workers out there right now in the middle of a pandemic, that your hand of protection is upon them, that um, that you're keeping them protected, not only that, but you're uplifting them in the strength of their minds and their hearts as they tackle these, uh, these events each and every day. We pray for us that are waiting to go back to our jobs, that... Um, we can go back and 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 actually have to apply these things in our life as we go back to a to a somewhat of a normal living we just pray that through all this we glorify you and provide that your spirit speaks between what they hear in the speaker and their hearts and their and their and their spirits and we pray this in the son's glorious name christ jesus amen all right so hey guys life happens our patience get tested uh, our nerves get fried and so let's turn to some scripture about work and so matthew 5 16 in the same way again this is going to be from the nl uh, the nrsv the, the new revised standard uh, standard version of the bible and it says in the same way let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your father in heaven and i want us to notice that that there's the assumption that we're going to be doing good works not for our salvation, but because of our salvation. Not for the God's grace, but because of God's grace. Not for his love, but because of his love. I hope we're getting the hint there. It's not something we do to be saved. It's something we do because we already have gone and accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. It's about the grace, the love, and the mercy that we receive and then turn outward toward others. And so there's the assumption that we're going to be doing that. And we're doing it not for our own glory, not for our own edification, not for any other reason, but to glorify God the Creator. And so think of it this way. God has given us the most awesome gift, the gift of salvation, the gift of grace and mercy and love. Those things God has given us. If you were a gift giver and you were to go out and give a expensive bracelet to to a, a, a a spouse, a, a girlfriend, a daughter, or somebody, or a, a nice necklace to a, to, to a son or husband or what have you, and they never wear it, how would that make you feel? They don't like it, uh, waste of money, could have gone somewhere else, so on and so forth. When I was 16, you know, a lot of kids today are, are, are very blessed and they get cars when they turn 16. I got a bicycle. What if I never rode it? Or about a, the more expensive car? How about if they never drove it? You would also feel the same kind of things. God has given us this gift of love, mercy, and grace, but if we don't use it, how does that make God feel? And and I think, you know, there's, there's, there's those questions. We can parse that in theology later, but... But I think as a starting point, it's a good starting point. So let's look at 1 Peter 3.15. It says, But in your heart sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. There's three things I want us to look in here. First of all, always be ready. Second, to defend uh, on demand. And what are we defending on demand? Accounting for the hope that was within us. So let's let's look at the always be ready in defense and de- uh, on demand. And I think we struggle with this. We, we struggle with it and it's difficult because we don't really work at it. And, and, and what I mean by work at it, we, we don't really know our own call story. I mean, we, we don't have it settled. We don't, we don't have it in a 30 to 90 second elevator speech. We don't know our own faith story. We, some of us don't even know what we really even believe. And so, so it becomes very difficult for us to share on demand uh, that 
faith or defend that faith in which, that we have if we don't know those things. And so why don't we know them? Well, there's several reasons why. First and foremost, maybe your church doesn't have a good Sunday school program or maybe it doesn't have one at all. Um, youth programs, or is it teaching fundamental ideas of, of faith? Are you in a scripturally based worship service? Not a not one where the preacher opens the word and then gives his own opinion or her own opinion on it. Or where they open the word and they they completely make it mean something else. That's that's something that's real fun to talk about. So real quick, great example of that. Jesus comes down off the mount curses the fig leaf or the fig tree because it's not bearing fruit kind of compares it with Israel looks at his followers that have followed him down off the mount mount zion and he says if you had the faith of a mustard seed you could tell this mountain is he heave itself into the water and it will okay i've heard sermons on that mountain is our finances our relationships our troubles our addictions and whatnot <clears throat> The faith part, I'll give you. The mountain is not. In that particular scenario, Jesus was giving his followers a death sentence. And what I mean by that is to say this. When he points back at that mountain and says, you will tell that mountain, that mountain was Rome. He's telling his followers that if they had the faith of a mustard seed, they could tell Rome to take a hike and they will. Now, do you think Rome was going to do that peacefully? Not so much. But anyway, I digress. Let's get back into it. Uh, so, so you may not be at a scripturally based worship service and that you also, a lot of people have a lack of desire to get into the Bible. Uh, they're more into to, to these things, right? Than they are to um, reading the Bible. And, and it's fine. You can have your Bible on the phone and you can do your, your Bible studies on your phone. I'm not saying the screens themselves are bad, but we're way, way into social media more so than we are the Bible. We're way into seeing what the Joneses are doing, keeping up with the Joneses and whatnot, than we are about what we're keeping up with what Jesus said. And so we, we struggle with the ability to, to have a clear defense of our faith because we're not rooted in the word. So we need to get rooted in the word. And that leads me into the, how we prepare for it. So to have a 30 or 90, 30 to 90 second elevator speech about your faith when asked for it allows you to plant seeds on a small, quick conversation with somebody. Does that mean that those seeds will just go <gasps> boom and bloom? No. I mean, one of the great things Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered, and only God grows it. They may be seeds that, that you don't get to see. As a Methodist preacher, sometimes we're planting seeds and two or three years later, we're moved on. We never get to see those those fl uh, flourish. And it might be two or three pastors later that actually get to see that or witness that. So so what we do get to see is, is this idea that a seed is planted. And with every seed that's planted, God has an opportunity to work that person. As I always say, God has an opportunity to, to take the Holy Spirit and jerk a knot in their tail. I say that to even my church members, so that's that's not unique to, to non-believers. Uh, but we need to also be studying the Holy Word because we're going to be questioned by it or about it. We're going to be asked, what does it mean when this is said? What does it mean when this is said? And if we're not in a good covenant group or Bible di uh, discipleship study or something where we're really diving deep into the Scripture in group, we'll never really be able to defend that Bible. And, and it's okay to turn around and tell somebody, hey, look, you know, I'm still learning this myself. Let me let me get the right answer for you. Or if you think you know the answer and find out a week later that you gave the wrong answer to come back and say, I need to be truthful with you. I found out that this scripture really means this and, and, and then provide it that way. So, uh, again, if your church doesn't have a, a discipleship making process in place, go to your pastor and say, hey, pastor, I want to start with you a discipleship process in this church. I guarantee you, for the most part, I pretty much guarantee you that there's not a pastor alive right now that would look at that and go, eh, not so certain about that. Let me lean in here. They really would be tickled over it. Okay. So this third thing in that passage that I wanted to look at. So we looked at the giving a, a defense, I always be prepared to do so. Uh, but the accountability of, of the hope that resides within. And, and so the first thing it, it is, 
it is a phrase that assumes that we understand we already have a hope residing within us. Uh, if we don't have that hope, we need to work on getting that hope and, and see all the things that I talked about a minute ago, right? As far as the, the study and the prayer and the, and, and, the, and the worship, all of those things being scripturally based and being deep and rich in the tradition of discipleship. If we truly want the hope or have the hope in us, we will exude that hope. It, it's not bitterness that's coming out. It's hope that's coming out. So if what, our, if what we're releasing from us is, is bitterness, then we are sowed with bitterness. And this is the passage that comes from the NLT or the New Living Translation. Mark 7, 15 says, It is not what goes in the body that defiles you. You are defiled by what comes from your heart. So if hope is in the heart, hope comes out of the heart. If hate is sowed in the heart, hate is what comes out of the heart. We act however our heart is sowed. So if, if, if you want to know what a person truly believes, just watch the way they they treat other people. That will let you know what a person truly believes. So you're at work, and the people around you, they don't act like Christians. What do you do? I would say you do you. It's probably the best thing you can do, right? We can We can be what God has made us to be. You do you, the best version of you. And, and, and we do that, but we struggle. We struggle because we're not rooted, or maybe we are rooted, but we're just a little shy. We need to get over that shyness real quick. Scripture also tells us that I didn't give you a, a spirit of timidity, but one of power and strength, right? So, our power and boldness. When we're working around those those people what's the easiest thing to do is to slide into their activity sin's easy guys sin is the easiest path to go your language your distrust your anger your frustration your envy all of these things are the easiest responses the quickest responses for people to develop jesus tells us the gate to destruction is wide that that is a like a, a 10 lane freeway into that gate but the gate into heaven is narrow and that, that is a winding, traversing, narrow road. He actually says not many will find it. The reason it's not found is because we don't look. And so uh, we need to make sure that what we're doing is uh, portraying the lifestyle of a Christian. So being that Christian at work or in that public place is difficult. I mean, like I've said before, it's something we have to practice, right? How do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. If all we do is show up for church on Sunday morning, we can't expect to be the example of Christ to those around us. We just, we just can't. And if we want the hard truth, the reason the church in a lot of places today are failing, are shrinking, are not growing, not, not vital and vibrant churches is because far too many people in the church today are Christians on Sunday morning and Satanists the rest of the week. And that's that's the hardest truth I can give you right now. And if, if you fit that description, I apologize. We all fall short of the glory of God. Yes, we all fall on our faces. We, 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 we might let a word go occasionally. We might turn around and just go, you know, at, at somebody. But we need to, to take those steps to make it a little bit better than that. And, and, and so we will mess up. It's quite honest. If we failed, when we if, if we stopped trying after we got our first wrong math problem or a wrong structure of the English language in a paper or, or whatever the subject may be, and we just stopped trying altogether, our world would have never advanced to where it is today. If we stopped trying after the failure of our first love, this world would not be populated. You know, So things in life that are worth and have any value, real value, they're tough. It's something that you have to fight for. Your marriage, your relationships, your family, uh, being a good disciple are all things that have great value that you need to fight for. Love the unlovable. Show your faith. Whether you're at work, the grocery store, or wherever it may be, 
When you do so, you sow the seeds of God's love, mercy, and grace. The free gifts that God has given you. God bless and take care.